KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, kicks off in Detroit on October 24th. And we're pleased to have Stu Miniman, who's the Director of Market Insights at, for Hybrid Platforms at Red Hat, back in the studio to help us understand the key trends to look for at the event, Stu. Welcome back, like old, old, old home. Thank week. you, Dave. It's great to, great to see you um, and always love d doing these previews, even though, Dave, come on, how many years have I told you? Cloud Native Con, it's a hoodie crowd. They're going to totally call you out for wearing a tie oh, and things so like that. Right. I, I, I know you want to be an ESPN sportscaster, but you know, I, I, I still don't think even after, you know, th this show has been around for so many years that there's going to be too many ties in Detroit. I know I left the hoodie in my office. I'm sorry, folks, but hey, we'll just have to go for it. Okay, containers generally and Kubernetes specifically continue to show very strong spending momentum in the ETR survey data. So let's bring up this slide that shows the ETR sectors, all the sectors in the tax taxonomy with net score or spending velocity on the vertical axis and pervasiveness on the horizontal axis. Now that red dotted line that you see, that marks the elevated 40% mark. Anything above that is considered highly elevated in terms of momentum. Now for years, the big four areas of momentum that shine above all the rest have been cloud, containers, RPA, and ML slash AI. From for the first time in 10 quarters, ML and AI and RPA have dropped below the 40% line, leaving only cloud and containers in rarefied air. Now, Stu, I'm sure this data doesn't surprise you, but what do you make of this? Yeah, well, well Dave, uh, I, I did an interview with uh, Deepak, who owns all the container and open source uh, activity at Amazon earlier this year. And his comment was, the default deployment mechanism in Amazon is containers. So when I look at your data and I see containers and cloud going in sync, yeah, that, that's, that's how we see things. Uh, we're helping lots of customers in their overall adoption. And this cloud native ecosystem is still, you know, we're still in that Cambrian explosion of new projects, new opportunities. Uh, AI is a great workload uh, for these type, type of technologies. So um, it's really becoming pervasive uh, in the marketplace. And, and I feel like the cloud and containers go hand in hand. Yeah. So it's not surprising to see those yeah, two it, above it's, the 40%. Look, you know, there, there's nothing to say that, look, can I run my containers in my data center and not do the public? cloud? Sure, but in the public cloud, the default is the container, and uh, one of the hot discussions we've been having in this ecosystem for a number of years is edge computing, uh, and of course, you know, I want something that, that's small and lightweight and can do things really fast. A lot of times it's an AI uh, workload out there, and containers is a great fit at the edge too. So wherever it goes, containers is a good fit, which has been keeping my group at Red Hat pretty busy. So let's talk about some of those high-level stats that we put together in preview for the event. So it's really around the adoption of open source software and Kubernetes. Here's you know, a few fun facts. So according to the State of Enterprise Open Source Report, which was published by Red Hat, although it was based on a blind survey, nobody knew that, that Red Hat was you know, initiating it, 80% of IT execs expect to increase their use of enterprise open source software. Now the CNCF community has currently more than 120,000 developers. That's insane when you, when you think about that developer resource. 73% of organizations in the most recent CNCF annual survey are using Kubernetes. Now, despite the momentum, according to that same Red Hat survey, adoption barriers remain for some organizations. Stu, I'd love you to talk about this, specifically around skill sets. And then we've highlighted some of the other trends that we expect to see at the event around. Stu, I'd love to, again, your, get your thoughts on the preview. You've done a number of these events, automation, uh, uh, security, governance, governance at scale, edge deployments, which you just mentioned, among others. Now, Kubernetes is, eight years old, and I always hear people talking about there's something coming beyond Kubernetes, but it looks like we're just getting started. Yeah, Dave, it, it, it is still relatively early days. Uh, the CNCF survey, I think said, you know, 96% of companies, uh, when, they, when CNCF surveyed them last year, were either deploying Kubernetes or had plans to deploy it. But when I talk to enterprises, nobody has said like, hey, we've got every group on board and all of our applications are on. It is a multi-year journey for most companies and plenty of them, if you, you look at the general adoption of technology, we're still working through kind of that early majority. We, you know, passed the, the chasm uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but to a point you and I were, were talking about this ecosystem, there are plenty of people in this ecosystem that could care less about containers and Kubernetes. Lots of conversations at this show 
won't even talk about Kubernetes. You've got you know a big security group that's in there. You've got you know certain workloads like we talked about you know AI and ML and uh, that are in there. And automation absolutely is playing a, a good role in what's going on here. So in some ways, Kubernetes kind of takes a a back seat because it is table stakes at this point. Um, so lots of people involved in it, lots of activity still going on. I mean, we're still at a cadence of three times a year now. Uh, we slowed it down from four times a year as an industry, um, but there's there's still lots of innovation happening, lots of adoption, uh, and oh my gosh, Dave, I mean, there's just no shortage of new projects um, and new people getting involved. And what's phenomenal about it is there's you know, end user practitioners that aren't just contributing, but many of the projects were spawned out of work by the likes of Intuit and Spotify uh, and, and many others that created some of the projects that sit alongside or uh, above uh, the, the, you know, the container orchestration itself. So before we talked about some of that, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's like Kubernetes is the big dog, right? And it's, it's kind of maturing after, you know, eight years. But it's still important. I want to share another data point that underscores the traction that containers generally are getting and Kubernetes specifically have. So this is data from the latest ETR survey and shows the spending breakdown for Kubernetes in the ETR data set. For, uh, it's cut for respondents with 50 or more citations in, in, by the IT practitioners. That lime green is new adoptions. The forest green is spending 6% or more relative to last year. The gray is flat spending year on year. And those little pink bars, that's 6% or down spending. And the bright red is retirements. So they're leaving the platform. And the blue dots are net score, which is derived by subtracting the reds from the greens. And the yellow dots are pervasiveness in the survey relative to the sector. So the big takeaway here is that there is virtually no red, essentially zero churn across all sectors, large companies, public companies, private firms, telcos, finance, insurance, et cetera. So again, sometimes I hear this things beyond Kubernetes. You've mentioned several, but it feels like Kubernetes is still a driving force, but a lot of other projects around Kubernetes, which we're going to hear about at the show. Yeah, so, so, so Dave, right, first of all, there was for a number of years like, oh wait, you know, don't waste your time on, on containers because serverless is going to rule the world. Well, serverless is now a little bit of a broader term. Can I do a serverless viewpoint for my developers so that they don't need to think about the infrastructure but still have containers underneath it? Absolutely. So our friends at Amazon have a solution called Fargate. They're a proprietary offering to kind of hide that piece of it. And in the open source world, there's a project called Knative. Uh, I think it's the second or third Knative con's going to happen uh, at the CNCF. And even if you use this, I can still call things over on Lambda and use some of those functions. So we know, Dave, IT is additive and nothing ever dominates the entire world and nothing ever dies. So we have, we have a long runway of activity still to go on in containers and Kubernetes. We're always looking for what that next thing is. And what's great about this ecosystem is most of it tends to be additive and plug into the pieces. Um, there, there are certain tools that you know, span beyond what can happen in the container world and aren't limited to it. And there's others that are specific uh, for it. And to talk about the industries, Dave, you know, I love, we, we have, we have a community event that we run that's going to happen at KubeCon it's called OpenShift Commons. And when you look at like who's speaking there, oh, we've got, you know, Ford, Lockheed Martin, University of Michigan, and ING Bank. Um, all speaking there. So you look and it's like, okay, cool, I've got automotive, I've got you know, public sector, uh, I've got you know, university education, and I've got finance. So all of, you know, there is not an industry that is not touched by this. Um, and the general wave of software adoption is the reason why, you know, not just adoption, but the creation of new software is one of the differentiators for companies. And that is what, that's the reason why I do containers isn't because it's some cool technology and Kubernetes is great to put on my resume, but that it can actually accelerate my developers and help me create technology that makes me respond to my business and my ultimate end users. Well, and you know, as you know, we've been talking about the super cloud a lot and the Kubernetes is clearly enabler to, to super cloud, but I wanted to go back, you and John Furrier, have done so many of you know, the, the cube cons, but, but go back to DockerCon before Kubernetes was even a thing. And so you sort of saw this you know, grow. I think there's what, how many projects are in CNCF now? I mean, hundreds. It's, it's hundreds, okay. And so you're, will we hear things in Detroit 
things like, you know, new projects like, you know, Argo and capabilities around SIGSTOR and things like that. Were you going to hear a lot about that or is it just too much to cover? So, in I, I mean, the, the good news, do, Dave, is that the CNCF really is is a good steward for this community and new things got in, get in. So, um, there's so much going on with the existing projects that some of the new ones sometimes have a little bit of a harder time making a little bit of buzz. Um, one of the more interesting ones is a project that's been around for a while that I think back to th the first couple of KubeCons that John and I did, uh, Service Mesh in Istio, which was created by Google, but lived under basically a, I guess you would say a Google-dominated governance uh, for a number of years is now finally under the CNCF uh, foundation. So uh, I talked to a number of companies over the years and definitely many of the contributors over the years that didn't love that it was a Google run thing and now it is finally part. So just like Kubernetes is, uh, we have Istio and also Knative that I mentioned before also came out of Google and those are all in the CNCF. So will there be new projects? Yes, the CNCF is sometimes they, they do matchmaking, so in some of the observability space, there were a couple of projects that they said, hey, maybe you can go merge down the road, and they ended up doing that. So there's still, you, you look at all these projects, and if I was an end user saying, oh my God, there is so much change and so many projects, you know, I can't spend the time and the effort to learn about all of these, and that's one of the challenges. And something obviously at Red Hat, we spend a lot of time figuring out, you know, not to make winners, but which are the things that customers need? Where can we help make them run in production for our, our customers uh, and, and help bring some stability and a little bit of uh, security uh, for the overall ecosystem? Well, speaking of security, security and, and, and skill sets, we've talked about those two things and they sort of go hand in hand. When I go to security events, I mean, we're at Reinforce last summer, we were just recently at the CrowdStrike event. A lot of the discussion is sort of best practice because it's so complicated and, and, and well, you, I presume you're going to hear a lot of that here because security, securing containers now, you know, the whole shift left thing and shield right is, is a complicated matter, especially when you saw with the earlier data from the Red Hat survey, the, the gaps are around skill sets. People don't have the skills. So should we expect to hear a lot about that, a lot of sort of how to, how to take advantage of some of these new capabilities? Yeah, Dave, absolutely. So, you know, one of the conversations going on in the community right now is, you know, has DevOps maybe played out as we expect to see it? There's a, a newer term called platform engineering and how much do I need to do there? Um, something that I, I know your, your team's written a lot about, Dave, is how much do you need to know versus what can you shift to just a platform or a service that I can consume? Uh, I've talked a number of times with you since I've been at Red Hat about the cloud services that we offer. So you want to use our offering in the public cloud. Our first recommendation is, hey, we've got cloud services. How much Kubernetes do you really want to learn versus you want to do what you can build on top of it, modernize the pieces, and have less running the plumbing and electric and more you know, taking advantage of, of the, the technologies there. So that's a big thing we've seen. You know, we've got a big SRE team that can manage that for you so that you have to spend less time worrying about what really is undifferentiated heavy lifting and spend more time on what's important to your business and your customers. So and, that's, so. and that's through a managed service. Yeah, really uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that whole space is just taken off. All right, Stu, I'll give you the final word. You, you know, what are you excited about for, for, for this upcoming event in Detroit? Interesting choice of, of venue. Yeah, uh, uh, look, first Easy of all, flight. I've, I've never <laughs> been to Detroit, so I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot and hopefully, uh, you know. Th awesome there, airport. There's some, some, some <laughs> good things there to learn. Um, the show itself is really a choose your own adventure because there's so much going on. The main show of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon is Wednesday through Friday, but a lot of the really interesting stuff happens on Monday and Tuesday. So we talked about things like OpenShift Commons in the security space. There's Cloud Native Security Day, which is actually two days and a SIG store event. Um, there, there's a GitOps show, there's uh, you know, Knative Day, there's so many things that if you want to go deep on a topic, you can go spend like a workshop, um, and some of those you can get hands on too. And then at the show itself, uh, there's so much, and again, you can learn from your peers. So it was good to see, we had during the pandemic, it, it tilted a little bit more vendor heavy um, because 
I, I think most practitioners were pretty busy focused on what they could w work on and less, okay, hey, I'm going to put together a presentation and maybe I'm restricted to going to a show. Yeah, we travel. definitely saw that last year when mm -hmm. I went to LA. I was disappointed how few customer sessions there were. It, it's back. When I go look through the schedule now, there's way more uh, end users t sharing their stories and it, it's phenomenal to see that. And the hallway track, Dave, I didn't go to Valencia, but I hear it was really hopping, felt way more like it was pre-pandemic. Um, and while there's a few people that probably won't come because Detroit, um, we think there's, what we've heard and what I've heard from the CNCF team is they are expecting a sizable group up there. I know a lot of the hotels uh, right near the, where it's being held are all sold out. So it should be should be a lot of fun. Good thing I'm speaking on an edge panel. Um, first time I get to be a speaker at the show, Dave. Oh, it's kind of interesting to be a little bit of a different uh, role at the show. So. Yeah, Detroit's super convenient. I said, I said, awesome airports too. Good luck at the show. Uh, so it's a full week. Uh, the Cube will be there for three days, yep. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thanks for coming. Wednesday, back Thursday, studio. Friday. Sorry, so, Wednesday, yeah. Thursday, Friday yeah. is the Cube. Right. So thank you for that. <laughs> Always awesome. And, and, and no ties from the hosts. No ties, only hoodies. All right, Stu, thanks. Appreciate you coming in. Awesome. And thank you for watching this preview of KubeCon plus CloudNativeCon with at Stu, which again starts uh, the 24th of October. Three days of broadcasting. Go to thecube.net and you can see all the action. We'll see you there.